Good evening and welcome. I am Amirachi Ubani. Tonight, three suicide bombers and a member of the civilian JTF are killed in two separate attacks in Meduguri, the Borno state capital. The Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Sadiq Abubakar, appeals for patience as the investigative panel into the RAN accidental bombing sets to work. The Sultan of Sokoto, Sayyad Abubakar III, challenges religious leaders who speak against killings in the name of religion. And U.S. President Donald Trump issues an executive order for a wall to be built along the southern U.S. border with Mexico. On business news tonight, Fitch Global Ratings changes Nigeria's long-term economic outlook from stable to negative. On sports news tonight, Blessing Okagwere's bronze medal at the Beijing Olympics upgraded to silver and Tatiana Nebedeva of Russia tests positive for banned substances. We begin tonight in Meduguri, Borno State, where barely a week after two suicide bombers struck at the University of Meduguri, killing four people. This is it was again thrown into mourning today following two separate attacks. Head of the NEMA Media and Public Relations Department, Sunny Dati, who confirmed the incident, says the first attack occurred on Saturday night and, and Tuesday night, beg your pardon, at the security output in Usmanti layout. The attacker was shot by the military. The second is set to have occurred early this morning when two suicide bombers, a male and a female, were trying to gain entry into a mosque in Kaleri area, but were spotted on time by the civilian JTF. The Kaleri Muna Axis has become notorious as many of the explosions that have occurred in Miduguri in recent times are either around that area or linked to it. Meanwhile, the internally displaced uh, people in the Rand community of uh, Kalabagi local government area of Bono State is still living in fear following last week's accident that left 236 people dead. Appealing to victims and families of the accidental bombing, the Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Sadiq Abubakar, says the Special Investigation Panel will soon come up with its findings. Most of these people would rather be indoors, but that option is no longer available. And even if it were, it would not be their preferred choice. Not with memories of the accidental bombing that reportedly claimed 236 lives still fresh. I lost my wife and daughter to the bomb from the airplane, and people were in pieces that day. Today, when we see them coming, everyone looks for where to hide, especially the children. We are lucky to be alive from the last time, so no one is taking chances. Ever since the incident happened, the military has been working round the clock with the chief of air staff calling for patience. Since we have given the task to highly qualified Nigerians, you know, our officers, to find out what really happened, please let us be patient. And let us give them the opportunity to do a good job, and I'm sure they will do a good job. The head of the Air Force investigation team says all efforts are being made to put their house in order. We are working uh, in line with the times of reference. And each time of reference, when picked, we ask our questions in that line, depending on what the answers are. Some of the responses will require further probing for us to clear some gray areas. But like I said, we cannot begin to preempt the findings of the board. An accident that should never have happened but did, and lives were lost. Beyond the sad story of the collateral damage is the need for accurate information to avoid a recurrence. The Sultan of Sokoto, His Eminence Sayyad Abubakar III, is challenging religious leaders to speak against the killings in the name of religion. 
The Sultan, who was speaking in Abuja, said that bad religious teachings and preachings have been responsible for the incessant violence, especially in southern Kaduna. Our correspondent, Gloria Umizuke, reports. The list of massacres owing to religious and ethnic clashes has grown tremendously in the country, especially in southern Kaduna. At this forum, the Sultan of Sokoto underlines the issues fueling violence in the north and disrupting peace. How do we make the authorities know these people, they profess Christianity, they profess Islam, but they are not doing what these two religions order them to do. Therefore, authorities please deal with them and we will support the authorities to deal with them. That's the only way out. But when we hide under that guise of religion, one uh, religious leader will miss so much venom that you wonder if he is really a religious leader. But because he's on your side of the divide, either he's a Christian or Muslim, you keep quiet. It means you support him. And that's where the big problem lies. Other clerics here believe the government should be more proactive in the matter to prevent anarchy. Whatever is your grievances, let the government know. Let the church know. Go and tell your imam so that we can resolve it. Why must you take joy in killing other people? Killings has been going on in southern Kaduna for a long time now. So is the federal government telling us they cannot redeploy soldiers to go and see what is happening and fight these animals calling themselves human beings? Whoever is caught in that has should face a penalty. If we should fight, let's fight hunger, disease poverty, malaria. These are common enemies to everybody. It is spirit of one's religion. Whether they are Igbo, Hausa, it does not matter. Religious and ethnic tensions have frequently been strained and so as religious leaders here revive concerns about this long-standing conflict, more Nigerians are hopeful for a lasting impact. Gloria Umezuke, Channels Television News. Well, one man who has been accused, uh, at least by the Kaduna State Government, of making inciting comments during his preachings is a leader of the Islamic Movement of Nigeria, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zakzaki. He is currently in detention following a clash between members of his group and the military in December 2015. Today, some members of the group took their protest to the National Assembly, demanding El Zakzaki's release. They were dispersed by the police with tear gas as they attempted to force their way into the complex. Members of the group have continued to protest in various parts of the country, even though their activities have been banned in some places, particularly in Kaduna State. They're asking that Sheikh El Zagzaki be released following a court ruling which ordered his freedom last year. <laughs> In the meantime, one religious leader who is not about to take any chances regarding his freedom is the founder of Omega Fire Ministries Worldwide, Apostle Johnson Suleiman. Ekiti State Governor Ayodele Fayoshe has cleared the air about how he foiled an alleged attempted arrest of the cleric by the Department of State Security Services. The governor explains how he was called upon by Apostle Suleiman who said he felt unsafe and insecure and wanted the governor to come to his rescue. He called me that the, the security or the set of people that came to arrest him and the crowd out there, he is not safe in the hotel. And I felt it's right for me to go there because I was part of a crusade. If anything goes wrong, it will still be, I will still be called to question. So the proper thing, whether he's a Christian or he's a Muslim, if, if I'm not aware of his being in town, it's a different ball game. I was part of a crusade. And the distress call, call coming from a man that pulls such, such a crowd could lead into so many, and, uh, so many issues and multiply effects on the state security. So the best thing is for me to go and get him from the hotel. I went there personally. I, was the, I went to his room to pick his box and all that. And I traveled with him in my car to the government house. Let's switch gears now to Ogun State, where Governor Ibikuli Amosun has promised the government would immediately commence the mapping and tracking of schools in the face of current security challenges. The governor said this when he received the released staff and students of the Nigerian Tulip International School at State House Abelkuta. 
It's a day after the release of eight kidnapped victims of the Nigerian Tulip International School. As early as 8 a.m., parents troop into the school premises in Isheri, Ogun State. Outside the school compound, the presence of security operatives is visible as repair works are ongoing to light up the school environment. The eight victims who had been receiving medical attention since they regained freedom were guests at the Ogun State Governor's Office in Abelkuta. Receiving the rescued victims, parents, top management of the school, and senior police officers in his office, the state governor, Ibikunle Ambusu, condemns the act and promises that the state will not let its guards down. All our schools are either, all our bodies will be even those that are not bodies. So we are trying to see again, we are going to see the rescue again, we so that we will make uh, will not be covered so for all these criminals. But let me assure them that uh, they will pay that for this because this is what we think we don't allow criminals. Nobody will come and disturb the peace of this state. This is not the place. That kind of a thing will be orchestrated. We are resolute, we are committed to the safety and security of not only the citizens of this state, but to our national duty. Also speaking after the visit, the managing director of the school describes the last 11 days as a traumatic experience. Days and nights were mixed in each other, uh, sleepless nights, anxiety. But at the end, uh, I want to thank uh, all the people of Nigeria, even abroad people, they really prayed for their safety. And at the end, now we are celebrating togetherness. The recurring incidences of kidnapping is a source of concern to most Nigerians, although the government continues to reassure the citizens of efforts being made to improve security across the country, Nigerians look forward to when security challenges like kidnapping will become a thing of the past. An assistant detective with the EFCC, Mr. Twisting Wobo, has told the Federal High Court sitting in Lagos. Our former chief of air staff, Air Marshal Adishola Amosu, and two other Air Force chiefs diverted the sum of three billion naira paid to the Nigerian Air Force by the Nigerian Maritime and Safety Agency, Nimasa. He said the money was paid in response to a request made by the Director General of Nimasa at that time. Our judiciary correspondent, Shola Shiele, reports. <laughs> In continuation of the trial of the former chief of air staff and 10 others, a third prosecution witness and EFCC detective, Tosin Owobo, continued his testimony at the Federal High Court sitting in Lagos. The witness told the court that investigations revealed that there is a memorandum of understanding between the Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency, NIMASA, and the Nigerian Air Force. In furtherance of this memo, NIMASA in 2013 paid the sum of one one billion naira and 480 million naira to the Nigerian Air Force under the leadership of a former chief of air staff, Air Chief Alex Badi. In continuation of this memo in 2014, the EFCC official testified that after Air Chief Adishola Amosu assumed office as the new chief of air staff, he wrote to the then Director General of NIMASA, Mr. Patrick Akobolokeme, requesting 4 billion naira as the cash amount needed for maritime security. Mr. Akobolokeme was said to have instead approved the payment of 3 billion naira a sum which was released in three tranches and paid into a Nigerian Air Force Special Emergency Operations account. The witness also says the authorization for the three billion naira to be paid into the special account was given by the then director of the Air Force accounts, Air Vice Marshal Jacob Bola Adigun, who is the second defendant in this case. According to the witness, however, the monies were subsequently transferred from the special accounts to various oil and gas companies, all of whom are also standing trial alongside the Air Force chiefs. The court admitted in evidence the statements of accounts of the oil companies, but a move by the EFCC counsel, Rotimio Yedeku, to get the witness to delve into some of the contents of the documents was rebuffed by the defense team. Justice Mohamed Idris has adjourned till Thursday, the 26th of January, to rule on whether the witness can answer questions based on the documents and for a continuation of the trial. Shola Shoyeli, 
Channel Television News. In part two after the break, the federal government says it is ready to confront the challenges in the nation's power sector. Please stay with us.